you guys doing? Y'all come on in. All right. Let me get on myself. Because, you know, my answer seems to like and share and do all that. So, I better be doing it myself. Y'all come on in. Good evening tonight. And welcome to Theology on Thursday. What's wrong? All right, y'all come on in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening. I am excited to be here with you tonight. Um, as you are coming in, let me know where you're coming in from. Say hello, because I would definitely say hello to you. Uh, Dominique Stroman, love you, man. Hey, bro, I was going to text you today because I want to see you uh, next weekend. So I'm going to text you to remind you, but I love you, man. Misha, hey, hey, hey. Great to see you tonight. Y'all come on in. I am excited about our time together tonight. I'm excited about Theology on Thursdays. As you know, for the Destiny Center RBA, Theology on Thursdays is our Bible study with a twist, where we take time from a virtual setting to hang out, to chill, to relax, but to go into an in-depth study of the Word of God. And it's actually one of my favorite times because outside of the preaching and the hollering and all the stuff that I love to do, we get an opportunity to have a sober conversation to ensure that you are growing line by line and precept upon precept in the word of God. I am not, Pastor Cheryl is not, we are not doing our assignment if we are not ensuring that you have a solid formation and theology and apologetic concerning the word of God. And so this is our time. Tasha, I love you. Good to see you. This is our time where we get an opportunity to spend some time together uh, to do just that. So do me a favor. While you're coming in, I need you to like it. I need you to share it. I need you to engage because that strengthens and widens our reach and our scope. And I believe that tonight and every time that we gather, that there is something that can be said that will touch that can touch the lives of many, many, many people. So I need you to be a digital evangelist tonight and share this broadcast with someone. Here's the last thing I need you to do. I need you to tag a couple of people. Tag about three to five people to say, hey, yo, come on in. Let's have a conversation tonight with Dr. Dwayne and the Destiny Center RBA as we jump into our discussion. So we'll give you just a few minutes to that. How's everybody doing today? I want to hear how y'all are doing today. Tell me about your day. Uh, Pastor Cheryl, hello. It's good to see you on here since I can't see you since you out and about traveling and stuff. I got to say hi to you virtually, but I miss you, girl. Sister Stephanie, hello, hello. Great to see you tonight. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? My day was good. Um, worked. I had the opportunity to eat lunch with uh, my wife, before she got on the road, she's traveling for work this weekend, um, and I ate with her and my twin and my youngest, D3, so I've had a pretty great day. Shante, I love you. I hope you are enjoying, Minister Shante, I hope you are enjoying your week of not talking to me. <laughs> I hope you are enjoying your week of not talking to me. <laughs> I love you and it's good to see you and I pray that you are well and that you are resting and you are indulging in great self-care. Listen, self-care is important. And one of the things that we are adamant about within our house, with our ministry is that our body, soul, and spirit will be presented blameless before the Lord. That means that it is important to take time with self-care. You, you must have, I'm teaching already, you must have a self-care regimen. If you don't have a self-care regimen, you can't be good to anybody else. Don't text me. Nope. You don't. You are banned from texting me until next week. So don't even text me because I'm not responding. I'm going to block your phone number. You can't even text me. All right, let's jump into this. Have y'all shared the broadcast yet? Have y'all liked? Have y'all shared? Have y'all done all that great stuff yet? All right. Well, good. Let's jump into the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for our time together. I thank you 
for everyone who's on, who is watching, and who will watch. I pray that they would be blessed by the word of God, that they would grow in their understanding, and that would be impartation and grace assigned to this moment that will benefit their lives. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Tanya, it's good to see you tonight. I love you. All right. Let's jump into our word tonight. Y'all ready? We're going to look over at Matthew chapter 4 tonight. I'm going to read a couple of verses of scripture to you. Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to read uh, the first few verses to you just to give you an idea of where we're going and what we're going to talk about. And then we'll jump in from there. Uh, Matthew chapter 4. Am I frozen? Because I look frozen on my phone. Is it just my phone? Mm -hmm. Is this my phone? Good. As long as it's just my phone. Let's rock out. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Matthew chapter four. Um, now it says that I'm paused. Or is it just me? We good? Or we don't know? Yeah. Say it again. We're good. All right. Matthew chapter four. Let's read. Then Jesus. I'm going to read it to y'all. I'm reading Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11. Somebody put it in the comment section. It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit of God. Well, excuse me, by the Spirit. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, love you, Jazz, to be tempted of the devil. Wow. It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Wow. What are we talking about tonight? And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. <laughs> now, when the tempter came to him, this is what the tempter said. He said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to a holy city set him on the pinnacle of a temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot upon the stone. That's what Satan said to Jesus. Then Jesus responds to him and says, it's written again that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, not just the kingdoms, but the kingdoms and their glory. Now, if I was preaching this from a Baptist traditional context, I would need to pause for a moment to look at the kingdoms and what is the glory of the kingdom. But I'm not preaching it that way tonight. But he said unto him, all these things I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Last verse that we're going to read and I'll give you our title and we'll jump into it. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Angels came and ministered unto him. I want to talk a little bit tonight using as a subject, the technology of temptation. The technology of temptation. Somebody type that in, the technology of temptation. And I'll share at the end why I'm bringing you into this subject. Um, but I was studying while I was reading the scriptures and just studying fasting. I fast every Monday. Um, unless an extenuating circumstance comes up, the Lord gave me that directive a few years ago. Um, and so I take every Monday to fast. And I, what I try to do is take away, I remove all church responsibilities, all of that. I try not to think about any of that. And I just focus on um, me and the Lord, building myself up in him, connecting with him, all of that great stuff. And as I was doing that and I was just reading through the scriptures, I landed on Matthew chapter four. And this passage began to grip me. And it was as if the Lord began to have a conversation with me right through this text. He began to speak to me right through this text. And I began to ask him, Lord, why are you talking about this? And he gave me the reason. I'll talk to you about it at the end. But I want to talk to you tonight about the technology of temptation. Let's build with some leading principles for tonight, okay? 
We'll build with some leading principles. Here's our first leading principle for tonight. Number one, how you live your life matters. Go ahead and type it in. We're going to do some work tonight. Number one, how you live your life matters. There is an erroneous, heretical doctrine afoot in the earth, in the body of Christ, that once I get saved and once I accept Jesus Christ into my heart, because of the reality of grace, that I get to live my life with no thought of how it impacts my Lord and Savior and my life as a whole. Because of the realm of grace, I can sin, 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 sin. I can do what I want to do over and over and over again. And there is no consequence and my salvation is secure. All because I've made a decision once at the altar. I want to challenge you tonight in your life to number one, even after you are saved, how you live your life matters. And then Paul makes this wonderful statement in Romans and he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he responds and says, absolutely not. The reality is, while there is grace that's in the earth, if we live our lives continuously as, the, as an opposition to the word of God, to his way and to his kingdom, what begins to happen, it becomes proof of the fact that I didn't really mean it when I went to the altar or that I'm not allowing myself to walk through the process of soul salvation. Here's what we want to start tonight. How you live your life matters. And once you get saved, while you come into the reality of this great relationship with Jesus, and while there is grace, there are still boundaries and parameters that govern your walk with Christ. That's another note to put in the comments. There are boundaries and parameters that govern my walk with Christ. I want you to get that. One more time. There are boundaries and there are parameters that govern my walk with Christ. Okay, number one, how you live your life matters. And moving on to principle number two. These are our guiding principles for our conversation tonight. Number two, there is an enemy that seeks to pull you out of the will of God. Guiding principle number two. First principle, how you live your life matters. Number two, there is an enemy that seeks to pull you out of the will of God for your life. That's important to know. The Bible tells us, and we've talked about this scripture before, to be in Corinthians, be not ignorant of Satan's devices. You have to know that there is an enemy that has been assigned to you, and there is an enemy that's been assigned to your bloodline, that has studied your bloodline patterns, that has studied the proclivities in your bloodline, and that are waiting to pull you out of the will of God. You've got to know that, right? Number one, how I live my life matters. It really does. And tonight, we're going to do some introspection. We're going to look at that. And number two, we've got to understand that there is an enemy that seeks to pull us out of the will of God for our lives. Why? We are all tempted. Can we be honest tonight in this sanctified digital church? That there are times in our lives where we hunger and thirst for things that are not righteousness. Y'all, okay. Don't be quiet in this sanctified church now, in this sanctified digital church. We all get tempted. But what I want to show you tonight and deal with is how to navigate through temptation. We're going to talk about how to navigate through temptation. We're talking about the technology of temptation tonight. All right. Next scripture for you, James chapter one, verse 14. And I'm going to read it to you. You don't have to turn there. Somebody put it in the comment section, but write it down if you're taking notes. James chapter one, verse 14. We're having a quick conversation tonight because I have some tacos that I want to go eat. Hallelujah. James chapter 1 verse 14 says that we are drawn away. I want you to get this as a principle. We are drawn away by the lust of our own flesh. We're going to talk about that scripture for a minute. James chapter 1 verse 14 says that we are drawn away 
by the lust of our own flesh. What does that mean? Whenever the enemy comes to tempt us, he doesn't dangle something in front of us that we don't already have a proclivity for. We are drawn away by the lust of our own flesh. He only comes to tempt us with what we already have a bend towards. Whatever is navigating, uh, yes, more tacos, the same ones as a matter of fact. Whatever we already have a bend towards, whatever is already circling in our humanity, that's what the enemy uses to come to tempt you and to pull you. So that means if you don't have a bend towards cocaine, that's not what he's knocking on your door with. But he may know that you have a bend towards women or men or cursing or self-defeating ideologies. But the scripture says that you are drawn away by the lust of your own flesh. It's your own flesh's lust that pulls you then out of the will of God. The enemy comes to prick at and to pull at that which you already have a bend towards. So here then becomes one of the first principles that we have to learn how to do. You've got to, be, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you at the end while we're having this conversation, you've got to, number one, be aware of your own triggers. You've got to be aware of your own proclivities. You've got to be aware of the things that are naturally a bend in you. There are some environments I know that I can't be in. There are some environments that you can't be in. Why? Because it becomes a trigger. You've got to know your triggers when you are in a space of stress. What wants to come out of you when you're stressed out? What do you want to do when you ticked off, we're talking tonight about the technology of temptation. And the scripture says in James chapter 1 verse 14 that we are drawn away by the lust of our own flesh. He only comes to pour at what I already have been towards in my humanity. Next scripture, Romans chapter 7. Verse 14, Romans chapter 7, verse 14, Romans chapter 7, verse 14 tells us that in your flesh dwells no good thing. You've got to know that about your flesh. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. In my flesh dwells no good thing. In your flesh dwells no good thing. If that's true, that means I will never be able to win the war of my war over my flesh with my flesh. I'm going to try to follow me. If it's true according to Romans chapter 7 verse 14 that in your flesh dwells no good thing, that means I will never be able to win the war over my flesh with my flesh. It's going to require something different. And many of us have failed. Thank you, Sister Stephanie. You work with me tonight. Everybody else quiet. It's all right. But you work with me tonight, Sister Stephanie. And many of us have failed because we're trying to fight a battle in our flesh while only using our flesh and not relying on the spirit and on the grace that the spirit enables us to live according to the principles of the word of God. There is a power that's been assigned to my character, and that's called grace. So when we look at grace, we're not looking at the grace, we're not looking at grace as the thing that we pull on when we mess up, but we're looking at grace tonight as the divine enablement to not mess up. Let me help you tonight. It is possible to live our lives 
and not have to always be tripped up. Now, we're human and we're working on our soul salvation and we have all sinned and fallen short. That is absolutely true. So I am not removing the fact that we are walking through a life process. What I am saying is once we get a revelation that sin no longer has dominion over us, come on, it changes that I'm always tripping up over the same thing. Okay, let's take our time. So as we walk through our journey of salvation, I should be able to look at my life's journey of salvation and see where I have grown in my sanctification process and things that were tripping me up three and four years ago, I should be over those places at this stage of my walk with God. Now, there will be things on the journey that I will have to continue to work through. But the true reality is, if I am yielded, and if I'm living a life that's constantly yielded to Holy Spirit, what, what was tripping me up three and four years ago, I should now be winning that battle in my flesh. But there is a technology of temptation that comes to pull us away from the will of God to live a life being okay with compromise. The enemy desires that you be okay with living a life of compromise. The enemy desires that you be okay with living a life of compromise. So we're talking tonight about the technology of temptation, and I want to help you tonight build your resolve and navigate temptation, all right? And again, I'll tell you at the end while we went through this conversation. All right, let's talk a little bit about temptation. Typically, you are tempted in one of three realms, okay? Typically, you are tempted in one of three realms. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Write it in the comments, please. Typically, you are tempted and one of three realms. Number one, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. What is the lust of the flesh? The lust of the flesh deals with the appetites concerning my flesh that I feel in my flesh that doesn't benefit my soul or my spirit, man, but they are things that I feel like I have to have. It is how then I sin many times against my body. It is the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh that don't feed my soul or my spirit man in a healthy way. That's the first realm that we're typically tempted. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. That's number two, which deals with what I meditate on. It deals with what I meditate on. It deals with my perceptions and my meditations. My perceptions and my meditations. With the lust of the eyes. We talked about number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. It deals with my perceptions and my meditations. What I meditate on. What I think on. Right? Especially when we talk about the eyes. Your Bible, the Bible says that your eyes are the window to your soul. So that which I gaze my affection on, my perception on, or I meditate on, begin to impact my soul in a positive or negative way. What is it, ask yourself, what is it that I'm constantly meditating on? Am I meditating on things that have a, a negative impact on my soul and my spirit? or a positive impact on my soul and my spirit. Okay, so number one, we deal with the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. Number three, the pride of life. The pride of life. The pride of life. Okay, so we did number one, lust of the flesh. Number two, lust of the eyes. Number three, the pride of life, which really deals with this humanism, what we call this, this humanistic spirit that's in the earth that really makes you the God of your own life. The ability 
or the desire to live life apart from the influence of God and his kingdom in my life. The desire for positioning, for approval, for living life outside of his realm of qualifications, of boundaries, of parameters, and what he says and stamps as a yes, okay? We're talking tonight about the technology of temptation, and I'm showing you how temptation happens typically in one to three realms. Now, what we're going to do tonight, Dr. K, I love you. It's good to see you. Um, now, what we're going to look at tonight is as we navigate it, we, so we started in Matthew chapter four. What I want to do tonight is pull some principles out of Matthew chapter four about the technology of temptation, because the end result is tonight you are going to learn how to overcome when the tempter comes to tempt you. The goal tonight is for you to learn how to overcome when the tempter comes to tempt you. So what was our two guiding principles? How do we start? Number one, our guiding principle number one was how you live your life matters. And you don't, we don't get the luxury of living any kind of way just because there is grace and mercy. James said it this way, I show you my faith by my work. So my salvation, hear me, your salvation is not based on works, but your works do prove your salvation. Write it down. Your salvation is not based upon works, but your works do prove that you really believe what you say you confess. Because our guiding principle, number one, how you live your life matters. Number two, there is an enemy that is that has come and that comes to pull you out of the will of God. All right. So let's look at Matthew chapter four. And I want to give you just two or three points out of Matthew chapter four. And then we'll wrap up tonight. When we look at Matthew chapter four, Jesus is in the space of fasting. And, it's, and the scripture says that he's led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, we got to look at that. He's led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Here's the first thing I want you to understand. Whenever you are, your soul is being pulled on and being tempted. I'm going to tell you the end of the text and then we'll back up. After Matthew chapter four, Jesus then goes on and he preaches one of the most powerful messages that he's ever that that is known today in Matthew chapter five, known as the Beatitudes, right? So Jesus experiences promotion after temptation. It's the first thing that you got to understand when we look at this text. Jesus is led up by the Spirit to be tempted, because many times temptation shows up right before promotion. The enemy becomes aware, and of course, heaven is already aware, that there is something that's on the radar for your life, for your next. And the enemy comes to try to see if you are really fortified in what you say so that you can be stripped of the promotion that's due to you. Allow heavy moments of temptation to be a prophetic indicator that promotion is on the way if I can pass the test. Number one, many times temptation shows up because promotion is on the way. Text says that he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and then he was hungry. The tempter comes and says, if you are the son, and we see right there, that's the lust of the flesh. He's hungry and he tempts him with bread. Something his, in his appetite, something his flesh needs. He says, number one, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus says, no. Number two, then he says, he takes him up into a holy city. So he starts on the ground. Then he takes him up into a holy city and he tempts him again. Jesus says, no. Then the text says, verse chapter eight, uh, verse 8, that he takes him up into an exceedingly high mountain. I want you to watch what's going on. The temptation starts here, on the ground. You're hungry. 
Then the temptation moves to a high on a holy city. Jesus says no. Then the temptation moves up into an exceedingly high mountain. And Jesus says no. Here's the principle. Say, the Bible tells us that Satan, and then after that, the scripture says, and the devil left him. So we understand by the text and the word of God that if you resist the devil, he will flee. However, before he flees, the temptation typically increases. I want you to think about this and remember this as you are living and walking through your life. It is true that if you resist the devil, he will flee. But typically before he flees, the temptation increases. Starts with food. Then he takes him up to a holy city. And then he takes him up to an exceedingly high mountain. The temptation increases before the text finally says, and the devil left him. Satan will leave you if you resist him. But typically before he leaves, a natural and spiritual. It's for both. Typically, before he, before he leaves, the temptation will increase. Here's the, here's the truth of the matter. Most of us, when we're tempted, most of us have enough willpower to say no the first time. Most people fall on the second and the third time. We feel something rise up in us. We, put, we pop it down. Nope, I'm not doing it. Rises up again. Lose a little bit of willpower. By the time it rises up again a third time, we find ourselves giving and giving into it. Most people don't lose the battle on the first round. We lose the battle as the temptation as the temptation begins to increase. So you've got to be aware that before the enemy, you resist the enemy and he flees, but before he flees. He's going to continue to pull to see if you are fortified in your surrender. Am I making sense tonight? Satan will leave you if you resist him. However, before he leaves, typically the temptation will increase. Here's the next thing I want you to see. When we look at verse chapter eight, verse, why do I keep saying verse chapter eight? When we look at verse 8, I'm, I'm going to read this verse to you again. We're in Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. When we look at verse 8, it says, Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And here's what he says, and this is the last temptation. This is the last one. He says, And all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Can I submit to you? that the final temptation revealed what Satan was after the whole time. It was never about bread. It was never about watching Jesus uh, jump um, so the angels can catch him. The temptation and what Satan was after the whole time was worship. Satan's desire is to pull you into a realm where Jesus is really not the Lord over your life and over your heart, even though you confess it. Satan's desire is to pull you into a realm of idolatry where the affection of your heart is based upon your proclivity, your appetite, and your temptation and not the Lord Jesus. It was never about bread, although he was hungry. It was never about him jumping so that the angel could catch him to prove who he was. It was all about at the end of the day, Satan was after his worship. Can I tell you at the end of the day, regardless of your area of temptation, again, I'll talk to you at the end, but while we need to talk about this tonight, regardless of your area of temptation and what pulls on you, there is one end goal. He's after your worship. We said this before. We've said it many times. Worship is not about who you sing to. Worship is about who owns you. 
That's a good note to put. Worship is not about who you sing to. Worship is about who owns you. So you can sing the song all you want. Give myself away. You are Lord of my life. But if you don't, if you don't find that he literally owns your decision making faculties, if he doesn't own your agenda, if he doesn't own your way of doing and your way of being, if he doesn't own your responses, then there are areas then where we have to look and say, he is not Lord over my life. The final temptation revealed what Satan was after the entire time. He was after worship. He is after the idol of your heart. And he wants to replace the Lordship of Jesus with the thing and your humanity that desires to own you. So what we've got to do is I've got to teach you tonight how to build your resolve. I want to teach you tonight how to build your resolve. And the answer we find it in the text that the text says in verse, in verse 2 that after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry in his flesh but because he lived a fasted life, his spirit was strong, although his flesh was weak. The key to your next season is a fasted life. I know we're not shouting and jumping tonight. I know I'm not telling you the blessing of Abraham tonight. I really want to have a conversation with you because I want to prepare you for the season that you're coming into. The season that you're coming into is going to require a fasted life. What does fasting do? Number one, fasting crucifies your flesh. What, what was the principle? If I'm going to win the war over my flesh, I can't win it with my flesh. So then fasting from a spiritual place crucifies my flesh, right? And it brings me into a life of surrender. We talked about worship. Fasting, number one, it crucifies my flesh and brings me into a life of surrender. And then it weakens the demonic influences that are vying for activity in my soul. Isaiah says this way, it looses the bands of wickedness. I just gave you three things that fasting does. Number one, it crucifies my flesh. Number two, it brings me into a life of surrender. And number three, it breaks, it weakens, it kills the demonic influences that are vying for activity in my soul. The key to building your resolve over the works and the technology of temptation is going to require a discipline fasted life. I had this entire conversation with y'all tonight. Hallelujah. Listen, Sister Stephanie, you're honest and we all need to be honest. You're just the only one hanging out with me tonight, for real. The Saints on. Thank you, Brother Joseph. They ain't talking to me tonight. This is not as exciting. I had this entire conversation with you tonight because I wanted to bring you into a heavenly awareness. Y'all with me? That the tempter is coming. I know what I heard the Holy Ghost said. Destiny Center, those of you who are watching, family and friends, sons and daughters, mentees and the like. You are primed for a space of promotion. Promotion is the agenda of heaven for your life. But I want you to know, I want y'all to hear me tonight, especially if you are a member of the Destiny Center. So before you texting me and calling Pastor Cheryl and setting up meetings, I want you to remember that we had this conversation tonight that the tempter is coming. That's not to scare you. 
It's to help you build your resolve and realize that promotion is coming. The prophetic word and warning is don't miss the season of promotion due to the proclivities of your flesh. Don't miss the season of promotion due to the proclivities of your flesh. Christ issued a death blow to the sin nature when he conquered the grave. So I don't care how the enemy lies to you and what he says Sin has no dominion over you. It is the lie of the enemy that we're exposing tonight that makes you feel that you are stuck in a thing that you don't have the ability to escape. According to the Bible, he promises us a way of escape. You've got to be diligent in your pursuit of the escape. That's a good point. Oh, you've got to be, now I feel the Holy Ghost. I want y'all to hear me as your prophet. That I, in this season, I must be diligent in my pursuit of the escape. Because I am being set up for a space of promotion. But I've got to conquer the thing that wants to pull me back into a realm of living the average ordinary life. Apart from the way that God desires it for my next season. There are things that the past season and the past season that you were able to perhaps get away with. There were things that you were able to slide through. But in the season of promotion... God's about to come and deal with your areas of conviction in your heart. There is another level of focus that God is requiring of his people in this hour. There's another level of surrender. There's another level of focus. And what God is bringing you into, he's bringing you into his dealings where he begins to apply pressure to the things that would disqualify you from walking into the fullness of the next season that he has for you. I want y'all to hear me. The tempter is coming. The tempter is coming. And I know it feels different tonight. This is a little more sobering than normal. It's not, the word in itself is not as upbeat. But hear me. The tempter is coming. It's not to scare you. It's to make you aware that promotion is on the way. And regardless of what the tempter throws, he has no dominion over you. It has no dominion over you. That's right. Subscribe to our, subscribe to our, uh, our YouTube channel. The tempter is coming. But so is promotion. And... The key to my next season hangs in the balance and it's based on my decisions. The promises of God are yes and amen. If I apprehend them or not, it's up to me. The prophetic words that have been spoken over our lives over our families. The promises of God are yes and amen. Whether I apprehend them or not, it's up to me. Because of the blood, I'm ending here, because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no temptation. There is no proclivity. There is no sin or weight that has the ability, that has the legal right to trip me up and to keep me bound.
because I'm already free in the liberty of Christ Jesus. Your instruction is to build your resolve. And we build our resolve based upon living, choosing to live a fasted life. What does fasting do one more time? Crucifies my flesh, brings me into a life of surrender, and it weakens the demonic influences that are vying for activity in my soul. So tonight, as we pray out, I want you to prepare to give. Tonight, as we pray out, I want you to take a strong, introspective look and say, and ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, highlight areas inside of me that have the ability to disqualify me from the place that you desire to bring me into. That's your prayer. I want you to pray it tonight. Before you go to bed, I want you to pray that prayer tonight. Holy Spirit, highlight, search me, Holy Spirit, and highlight in me. We're going to all pray it. I'm going to pray it too. Holy Spirit, search me and highlight in me the things that have the ability to disqualify me from entering into the thing that you've called me to walk into. That's your assignment for tonight. Because it's my prayer that we would all experience, excuse me, that we will all experience the promises of God that has been assigned to our lives. And I don't know about you, but I refuse to miss this next season. <laughs> I, I, Y'all, come on here. Now, if I was in church, I'd have told the band to tune up with me right here. I've worked too hard. I've sacrificed too much. I've lived and suffered through too much to get to this place and not apprehend the fullness of what God has for me. If we were in church, I would say, touch your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I'm going to get all that God has for me in this next season. And I want you to make that con your confession and your declaration that I'm going to get all that God has for me in this next season. My family is going to get all that God has for us in this next season. My ministry is going to get all that God has for us in this next season. All that God has for us in this next season. We've lived through too much. We've prayed through too much. We've sold too much. We've prophesied too much. We've suffered too much that I am about to experience a realm of glory that I've never seen. Come on, encourage yourself in the Lord. I'm about to experience a realm of glory that my family has never seen. My finances are about to experience glory. My ministry is about to experience glory. My career is about to experience glory. My joy is about to experience glory because I'm not going to miss the thing that God has called me to walk into in this next season. I am fortified in my resolve. I am fortified in my yes that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Let's pray and let's get out of here. I want you to sow tonight. The ways of giving are up. Y'all know the realm. Y'all know what to do. We don't beg you to give, but you need to sow tonight. I want you to sow. Uh, by way of announcement, you know that uh, this Sunday is our Team Sunday. Uh, Pastor Shug and I are going to be in the building for Team Sunday. Make sure you come hang out with us virtually and in person. And next week, March chapter 18. <laughs> March, not chapter 18, because that is not a scripture. I'm in the flow. I probably should have did that afterwards. <laughs> March 18th at 7 p.m. are we at Sam Revival Nights. Make sure you are in the building. Father, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for my family and my friends, my sons and daughters, mentees, and all of your children who are on tonight. Yes, God. And I thank you that this is, according to the word of the Lord, a season of promotion for your people. And I thank you in Jesus' name that although the tempter may come, he will not be able to distract and he will not be able to hinder us from the thing that you called us to walk into. Holy Spirit, search us. Make it known to us 
the things that are on the inside of us that have the ability to disqualify us from the next season. And here's the prayer. Give us grace to move beyond it. Give us grace to leave it in this season and not bring it into the next. We thank you that Christ has dealt a death blow and has issued a death blow and a death decree to the sin nature, and it has no dominion over me. And so we thank you tonight that he whom the Son sets free is truly free indeed. And we love you, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all. It's so good to be with y'all tonight. We'll see you Sunday at Team Sunday. Uh, we'll see you uh, next week for our Revival Nights. Peace.